Good morning. Welcome to worship here at First Presbyterian Church. We're glad that we could gather together in comfort and warmth with friendly people. Have a couple of announcements to make before we uh, begin our worship proper. After worship this morning, we have a Christian education meeting. And um, if you notice on the back of the bulletin, I placed my phone numbers, my cell number. So if you find somebody from Florida calling, it might be me. So that's there for your information. Uh, this coming Saturday, the Presbytery of the Pines will be meeting and ask for your prayers as we gather together to consider the amendments that have been passed down to us to vote on from the last two Presbytery, I mean General Assembly meetings. And so safety for people traveling back and forth. We got some bad news this week. The air conditioning unit in the annex has to be replaced. And that's another $10,000 or more that it's gonna cost us to have that repaired. And that also reminds me is that we only have half of the people who gave pledges a couple years have sent in their pledges to uh, for this year. And so we're still waiting for half of the people to respond. So if you want our church to continue, please let us know by making a pledge. Next Sunday will be our Scout Sunday. We'll host our Scout troops. And afterwards, Seth Sexton will have his Eagle Ceremony. And everybody's encouraged to stay after worship and participate and celebrate with our Scouts. February 19th on a Saturday. Uh, uh, well, at, um, on a Sunday, so um, be a lit liturgist training for anybody who's interesting to be a worship leader. And that's the announcements that I have. Anything that I left out? Nope. Please read the announcements and prayer requests in the back of the bulletins. So let's calm ourselves now. Focus upon the word of God and feel the spirit of God among us as we listen to the prelude.
join the choir and stand as we call one another to worship. Our call to worship is based upon Psalm 112. It tells us, Praise God. Blessing comes to those who fear the Lord. They shine out as light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. They conduct their affairs with justice. They give freely to the poor and will be remembered. Their hearts are firm, secured in the Lord. They will not be afraid. Amen. Let us praise the Lord our God together. We do have a desire to praise God and to please Jesus, but if we are honest with ourselves, we know that we have failed at doing that. We do things that we should not, and we don't do what we know we should. Yet we know because of the grace and love of God, Jesus accepts us and keeps us as the children of God, and that we come together so that we can improve our faith. So with that in mind, let us pray together the prayer of confession. Holy and just God, we confess we often perform religious rituals while refusing to do your will. We hide our true beliefs, quarrel, ignore injustices, and dishonor you. Forgive our self-righteousness. Help us be hospitable, gracious, and kind and be responsible members of your community so that we may shine forth the light of your salvation through Christ our Lord. Amen. God has not left us to live with our failures and sins. Jesus has come to forgive and transform. So then, we have, been unite, we have united ourselves to Jesus and follow his example and teaching. Thanks be to God.
The peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another with the peace of Christ. And as the adults take their seats, we'll have the children come down front. Good morning. I've got something in the bag. Can you tell me what it is? Oh, come on. Surely you know what's in the bag. What's in the bag? Well, let's look and see. What do I have in the bag? What's in the bag? A flashlight. Yes. And that flashlight is shining, right? He answered my next question. What is the flashlight for? He said, to see in the dark and to turn on. And he got that right. Good job. Well, that's what a flashlight is for. It's to help people see in the dark and help us see in the dark. And in our lesson today, okay, I know that we could see the dinosaur too. But in our lesson today, Jesus is telling us and the disciples, he told them, said, I want you to be the light into the world. In other words, I want you to go out and tell everybody that God has a better way for us to live. But I don't want you to hide your light where it can't be seen. I want you to have that light out where everybody can see it all the time. You can see it, I'm glad. That's, I'll give it to you in just a second. But anyway, that's what he wants us all to do is to take our light, shine it out so everybody can see what God has for us and for them. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for the light that you sent into the world, and may we be the ones that take this light out and show everyone. Thank you. Amen. Before we turn to scripture, let us pray. O oh Lord, open our hearts and minds. May your light permeate all areas of our lives. Speak to us and make your presence felt. In Jesus' name, amen. Our first passage is Isaiah 58, verses 6 through 11. I'll be reading from the new RSV. And here Isaiah tells us that worship should be something that inspires us 
to help one another. We're supposed to love God and other people, our neighbor. They go hand in hand. So if we just go through the motions of worship and our thoughts and our actions aren't transformed, if we're not being inspired to help others, then our worship is nothing more than a worthless ritual. And that is what Isaiah is teaching us in this chapter. Hear God's word. Is not this the fast that I chose? to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing of the finger the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong. Ye shall be like a water garden, like a spring of water, whose water never fail. Now we turn to Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. And Jesus repeats the same major idea that Isaiah had, but instead of talking about being a well-watered garden, Jesus says we're supposed to be like salt and light. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under a bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to the Father in heaven. The word of the Lord. <clears throat> Near the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, surrounded by a bunch of poor, unassuming disciples, Jesus said, You, and only you, because you're following me, are the salt of the earth. Yes, you, little and weak flock, are the light of the world. Any Roman of the day or a Pharisee would have scoffed at such a declaration from Jesus. Those around Jesus had no military, no religious or social power, no capacity to travel the world, and no persuasive rhetorical skill. Nevertheless, Jesus here declares, they were the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Jesus declared that they were, not that they would become the light in the future. He did not tell them to strive to be or to make themselves into salt and light but that they were salt and light. 
He does not challenge them to become salty, but rather to stay salty. Similarly, he did not challenge them to become God's light, but rather not to hide the light of God within them and to do good works. We are like salt and light. Not because we have extraordinary skills, abilities, or powers, but because we follow Jesus, who is the light of God in the world. We have the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus within us, and so we are lights and salt. So what does this metaphor mean to us? Well, in ancient Israel, Salt was used to preserve and season food for purifying newborn babies and wells and for cleaning wounds. It was a sign that was used for spiritual purity, added to sacrificial offerings, and sometimes Roman soldiers were paid by salt. To eat salt meant to take a meal. To have salt in oneself meant making peace with others. And speech seasoned with salt meant to be gracious and offering up apt answers. Salt was a necessity of life and in, involved in all areas of life, in economics and family and social gatherings and in worship. It preserved cleansed and enhanced life, but only if it was applied. Salt had to be rubbed into meat or applied to the skin or dissolved in water to be effective. Being salt, therefore, means getting involved with others to preserve and enhance life. We disinfect sin and evil by warning others of evil. We preserve life by providing relief from the effects of sin. We enhance life by solving problems, improving relationships, the environment, and health, bringing joy and pleasure and blessings upon others, and reconciling people to God and to one another. Of course, to do this, we must have a zest for life and a zest for faith. We cannot be salt and also kill joys. We cannot be bitter, morose, stupid, or depressing. When we tell others that we're going to attend church, we shouldn't make it sound like it's a burdensome duty. I have to go, I have to go to church. Rather, we should be telling it's a privilege and a joy. I can't miss going to church. Why don't you come with me? Neither can we be the salt of the earth if we isolate ourselves and stay uninvolved with other people around us or if we become just like unbelievers. We must retain our values and beliefs and demonstrate our faith and our joy in Jesus. We must preserve and enhance life in such a way that others become thirsty for Jesus. Many years ago, the First Presbyterian Church of Safety Harbor, Florida, had all the movers and shakers of the city as members of that congregation. Public school teachers, the head of the hospital, the mayor, and all the city councilors were there. The pastor thought that his congregants were doing good things for God and country, until he learned about the city's plan about bringing electricity into the city. They were not planning to 
who wire the black side of town, those people who lived on the other side of the tracks. The council's plan was racist and unjust. The council was supposed to work for the good of all citizens. Christians were supposed to preserve and enhance life for all. So at the next council meeting, the pastor went and told them to provide electricity for the whole city or else they would no longer be deacons, elders, or trustees of the church. Christians must work for justice, equity, and righteousness. And after the pastor's reprimand, they changed their plan. They made sure everyone in the city, the whites and the blacks, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, church members and non-members alike, had running water, sewage, and electricity. Life was preserved and enhanced. And people were glad that First Presbyterian Church existed. This brings us to Jesus' second metaphor. We are the light of the world. And our light cannot be hidden unless we're so stupid as put it in a bag or under a bushel basket. No good person hides their light. Instead, they shine their light throughout the house so that other, all the people in the house can see one another and the things. All, all can benefit. Likewise, we who have the light, the light of God within us, must demonstrate that light by doing good deeds and bringing glory to God. This also would have been scoffed at. According to the Romans, the emperor and his empire were the light of the world. According to the Old Testament, the nation of Israel was the light of the world. That is, they were going out into the world teaching Gentiles about God and converting them to Judaism. Yet here Jesus is saying that his followers were the light of God shining forth in the darkness. In other words, we are supposed to proclaim, demonstrate, and teach the truth and joy about being disciples of Jesus. Let's consider what does light do? It enables people to see. It points the way to safety. It reveals obstacles and dangers. It spotlights what's important. And it invites all people to come inside. Light is a necessity. Required for vitality and health. Like salt. It's essential and enhances light, life. Thus, here, Jesus explicitly connects being light to doing good works which cause other people to glorify God. In other words, Jesus doesn't want us to shine starlight, but lamp light. Starlight is drawing attention to us as individuals. Lamp light shows light away from us to other things and people. Jesus wants us to live so that we can point others to Jesus. In 1989, 25% of the population of San Sebastian, a town in Puerto Rico, were unemployed. Most were on welfare, lived by subsistence farming, and occasionally worked at the sugar mill. The Ingesia Presbyteriana Church wanted to evangelize the town. So they trained evangelists to go knocking on doors. 
For two years they knocked on doors and tried to share the gospel. And for all that effort, two people were converted. Two years, two people. Their first reaction after that two years was to give up. But then they started thinking what the needs of the community were around them. And they realized that the people were not ready to hear the message about eternal salvation. They needed to hear good news about getting help before they could hear good news about the gospel. So instead of providing Bibles, they provided wheelchairs food, clothing, money, and counseling. And they became known as the repairers of brokenness. People who made the community inhabitable. All the people were excited about their community becoming a place of beauty and hope. Within five years of changing their tactics, 150 members jo joined the church, 170 children started attending youth group on Fridays, and seven home Bible studies were flourishing. And all these things were being run by the laity. The pastor was not burnt out, and the congregation didn't have to hire another pastor. They were truly God's salt and light to the people of San Sebastian. What about us? Are we involved with others in thus preserving and enhancing life? Are we doing good work so that people are glad we exist? Are we speaking about our faith and pointing others to Jesus? Do people see the God's grace, love, mercy within us? Or do they see fear, confusion, boredom, or anxiety? Yet as we think about living in such a way that attracts others to Jesus and points to Jesus, we have to be careful not to dilute our faith and values. We do not want to obscure the light and try to cover up the demands of Jesus. As Helmut Tilke comments, Jesus did not say, you are the honey of the world. Salt can sting as it cleanses. It is abrasive when it's rubbed on meat or applied to the skin. Light can momentarily blind us. And similarly, faith in Jesus will not always be comfortable. Faith will not keep us as we are, but it will transform us. And that often means a radical change in our thinking and actions, as well as enduring hardships. In other words, we are to enhance life and preserve life, while at the same time of fighting against the effects of sin and warning others about sin. An example of this, John Stott gives from the United Kingdom where the congregation every year protests against pornography but at the same time presents the joy in the wholesomeness of Christian morality. So fighting against the evil while also promoting what is good and right. We don't go along with everything in our society. We don't do any and everything to attract people to us. We are not a honey pot. Likewise, we won't be a sugar daddy or a doting grandparent. At the same time, though, we won't be 
repulsive, an emotional drain, or a party pooper. What we will be is what we truly are in Christ, the salt and the light of God in the world. Amen. The message that we believe in and staked our lives upon has been put down in an outline form in the Apostles' Creed. So let us stand and reaffirm our faith by using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us turn to God in prayer. O oh Lord, help us to be your salt and light among the people around us, preserving and enhancing life and vitality and faith. Inspire and enable us to share our resources to help others. Give us freedom from fear and need in order to bless those around us. Keep us from being so dogmatic, proud, selfish, or fearful that we unnecessarily turn others away from faith in Christ and that we would quit doing good deeds or work for justice. 
We know we cannot solve all the ills of the world, and we desperately need your help. So we pray that you would intervene and orchestrate assistance to the, those who are in need. Help all the people of faith shine forth your love and grace to those who do not know you. Help your truth and righteousness penetrate the darkness, break through despair and apathy, and bring liberation from addiction, fear, negativity, and false guilt. We pray for our world, for the governments and its leaders, that they may honor justice, be compassionate, and serve the common good so that people may flourish and feel secure and hopeful. May the hungry be fed, the afflicted healed, the disenfranchised empowered, the sick cured, the homeless housed, the oppressed liberated, and the enslaved freed. Now hear us as we pray together the prayer your son taught us, praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Because the light of God has enlightened our hearts and minds, because we are called to be like a well-watered garden, a refreshing, never-ending spring, as well as salt and light, let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God so that we can do good deeds and others can glorify God. Let us collect an offering at this time.
loving God, accept the dedication of our hearts, minds, and bodies for the ministry of your kingdom. Amen. Let's remain standing as we prepare to meet the Lord at his table by singing, Let us talents and tongues employ, hymn number 526. This is not the Presbyterian table. It's not a table for perfect people. It's a table for sinners. All who recognize that they need Jesus as much as they need bread and water. Come and taste and see that the Lord our God is good. We will celebrate the Lord's Supper. symbol of our unity of the one people God, we will eat the bread together. And then also, since we all, all of us have to have an individual relationship with God, we'll drink the juice separately as the table is given. So join now with me in the great prayer of thanksgiving. And then I'll turn the mic. Here we go. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give thanks and praise, God of majesty and splendor. By your power you created all that is, making a universe out of chaos and ruling over all things with love. Throughout the ages you call your people to love and serve you and be your light among the nations and preserve and enhance life for all peoples. We praise you that in the fullness of time you revealed your love by sending Jesus to be the light of the world. He taught the people how to live in your light and to be the light before others, being godly, righteous, and loving neighbors all around while expressing concern and giving practical care. We give you thanks that Jesus proved your love for us by enduring a hard life for us, persevered through faith, died, and was risen from the tomb so that we could receive the blessings of the new covenant and be a blessing upon others. Remembering your gracious acts in Jesus Christ, we take from your creation this bread and this juice and joyfully celebrate his dying and rising as we await the day of his coming. With thanksgiving, we offer our very selves to you to be a living and holy sacrifice dedicated to your service. 
Gracious God, through the Holy Spirit, transform this bread and juice so that they may be food to our souls and unify us as one family serving your kingdom on earth. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was betrayed, after giving thanks to God in prayer, he took a cup and he said, oops, wrong one. He blessed the bread. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of me. And after they ate their supper together, that's when he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant, which is established by the outpouring of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink of it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim that the Lord has died, that he's risen, and will come again with great power and glory for the everlasting blessing of life under God. Spiritual food for spiritual people. Let us, the elders, come forward. it doesn't matter. the bread of life.
After the disciples ate their last meal to Jesus, they left their upper room and went to the garden for prayer. But before they did that, they sang a song of prayer, praise. And so we will end our service today by singing, I'm going to live so God can use me. Let us stand and sing. Go out and be a life-enhancing preserver, water, salt, and the light of the world. May Christ, the true light of God, shine upon you, enlightening your mind, leading you forth, and dispelling all fear. Amen.